Sergeant Robert J. Martin, United States Army, World War II. Robert Martin is one of my most dear and beloved veterans, one of the first veterans I interviewed almost 20 years ago. It was February 27, 2003 in Chandler, Arizona. The first love of my work, folks, all the World War II veterans, Omaha Beach D-Day veterans I interviewed at that time, and his wife Fran, I got to know her too. Robert passed away five months after this interview in December of 2003, so he's been gone almost 20 years, folks. But he was 81 years of age when I interviewed him, told a great story about the Omaha Beach landing and his involvement with the 110th Anti-Aircraft Battalion with the 1st Army. And uh, again, one of my truest, dearest friends, Bradford, you know who you are out there who love the salutes. I got a gentleman named Bradford that comments and watches them. You're going to love the ending of this video. I guarantee it. Let me know what you think. But I want to thank Christopher Mead. Chris, God bless you, sir. Thank you for your continued support of my work and for allowing me to share Robert Martin's story with my YouTube audience here. Many people are going to learn from this. The World War II stories, folks, to me are the most important because they're the oldest stories we have of our history and we need to learn from our history so we don't make the same mistakes. So, Chris, thank you. God bless you. Thank you for your support, like I said, of my work and uh, allowing many others to hear this amazing story by Robert Martin. And uh, folks, I'd like to encourage you if, you, if these stories are tugging at your heart, consider donating at least to the work, folks. There's some information in the comment section of the video where you go to comment. There's a link there. Click on that. Or if you'd like to sponsor one of these stories like Chris has done, you can do that by clicking on the link in the video description underneath this video or go to my website LarryCapetto.com and click on the sponsor of that link. So anyways folks I'm just so grateful my heart's full I was so so happy to bring you Robert's story one of my first stories that I did one of my first D-Day Omaha Beach veterans and just a, just a totally blessed story and interview that I did with him such fond memories. Thank you for subscribing to this channel thank you for sharing these videos and watching them History is best learned from those who are there. And folks, we're fighting for the same freedoms in our own country today that our veterans like Robert fought for on foreign soil. Let's, let's, let's fight for them today, okay? Amen. God bless you. division you're with in World War II and, and what's if you remember approximately what time you landed on the beach and just mention Omaha Beach so just introduce yourself. Just just introduce myself. Yeah just tell me who you are just for my record and, and what company you're with in the division and all that all the technical stuff. Well my name is Robert J. Martin and I was with the 110th anti-aircraft battalion and we were under first army And what else do you want to know? <laughs> Tell me this approximately what this we're going to go back and talk about that. Did you land it on Omaha Beach approximately yes. what time? Well, we were out in, out in the beach D Day, but we didn't get off of the boat for another day and a half. So you went in probably D Day plus two or? Plus, it was either plus one or two. Okay. 
Do you remember which sector of the beach you're on? Easy green, easy red. Do you remember dog green, dog red? Oh, I don't remember don't that. Worry about it. Now, did you write it? Now, I'm gonna. We're gonna go into the interview. I'm just kind of asking you questions for my sake. Now, did you write it? Put the front end of it down. Okay, around. To go in, yeah. So, did you go ashore? Yep. Okay. And I, I'm sorry again. What you were with the infantry or not? No. Okay. What was your job? Uh, we was we was on, with an aircraft. Okay. 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 Eisenhower got the idea that we should have an aircraft when the boys were going in on the beach. Okay. Okay. So. So here's here's what I want you to do then. Um, First of all, just now, did you did you sail on that boat all the way from England, or did you trans? Were you transported into that boat we, under the ships? We left that. We left Exeter, England, mm -hmm. and we was on underneath there and didn't even see daylight for eleven days, and we couldn't figure out what they were doing. But I guess they were trying to throw the Germans off of where we was going to go in, mm -hmm. because about I, I think we got off about the twelfth or thirteenth day. Tell me a little bit about the trip to the beach. I mean, uh, when you finally did go into the beach, was there a lot of apprehension among you guys? Oh. Was there fear, concern? Were you hearing reports of the first waves on D-Day? Just give me, think back in your mind. What were you thinking? What were you seeing? What were you feeling? What we really thought is that we'd never get in there. Because when we were sitting out there, when we got off, I think it was First Harmony. I don't remember what infantry you raised. But whatever one it was, they lost everybody. And we went in second, there was bodies all over, everywhere. So, and I can't remember the division that went in first. Now, tell me a little bit about, you were how old, 19, 20? I was 20, you don't have to see, I, exactly. I was 20, about 20 and a half. Okay. You were a young man. And I, was, I was the only one in my outfit that was yeah. married. T tell me, you, you, you said you mentioned you, when you got out of the boats, did you see dead bodies on the beach? Were they firing oh. at you? Tell, relive that. Tell me about that. They were all over. Tell me. They were all over. And when we we come up, we come out of the bottom to go down to the boat. And when we got up to uh, disembark, there was a captain there on the where we went down the steps to go to the get off. And he said, he I can remember he said. If they think they're going in there, they're crazier than hell. <laughs> I can remember that. But uh, we were on the, uh, we were on that beach for, oh, it must have been at least seven days before we got over the first hill. At least seven days. But we were fairly lucky because the Germans had guns in the hill there, but they wouldn't go only so low. I mean, so if you stayed on the beach and you kept down, you're pretty safe. But uh, if you stood up, you was in trouble. So. Were you guys armed? Do you have rifles? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, okay. I don't want to go too fast here. Okay. So you said when you were on the boat before you got to the beach, were, were people scared? Were they praying? Were they talking? What was the mood like? I mean, what were you guys feeling, you know? No, I can't remember a lot about it. Okay. Were you, do you remember being scared? Or yeah, I was scared. Did you, were you afraid to die? Were you thinking, no, I've got a mission, I'm not going to think about dying? What were you thinking about? He, well, if a guy said he was not as scared to die, he's crazy. Something wrong with him, but uh, uh, with the way the beach was. But uh, I don't remember. We made it go. We had uh, four batteries, and they all had 90 millimeter guns. And we got them all off on the beach. So I don't. Now, when you came out of the boats, were you weighed down with packs? Did you get out in the water? Did you get out in the sand? Were they shooting at you when you got out? Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. We were. They were firing pretty heavy when we got off, but the reason we had to get off is because they was bringing a lot of infantry back on our boat, and they got so many infantry on there that we pretty had to get off because they was bringing all the wounded back that was just wounded onto our ships. I remember that. Because they told us we had to, we had to get off. There was no question about it. So, and I remember that, and I remember getting on the beach. It was, we couldn't move them ninety millimeters. I know that they were so heavy that that sand you just couldn't move them. So we had trouble there. But I don't. Uh, 
Now the Germans were shooting at you. Yeah. I mean, were you hearing the bullets hit the beach, hit the sand? I mean, hit the boat, or were they flying over your head? What do you remember about that? I've seen the tracers. Well, tell me, tell me about that. What, what, I mean, you're getting on the boat, you're ducking down. What are you doing? I mean. Yes, you stayed real low. And the fact that we got onto the beach, we crawled. You never stood up. We didn't stand up for several days there. So I don't, until they got them, uh, I don't know what size guns they were in the banks there, but until we got them knocked out, we couldn't do hardly anything. And they said there'd be a lot of aircraft and stuff there too, but I didn't see it. I don't remember any aircraft that day. So I don't know. Were you were, were buddies on either side of you being hurt or shot or anything? Do you remember anything like that? Or? Oh, yeah. Tell me, yeah, tell they, me what you remember a little bit. Oh, well, they were getting shot. There was a lot of them getting shot, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I didn't pay much attention to that. I just you, saving your own skin, I guess. But uh, I think that article on us that uh, Bob, my son's got, well, I think we had 110% casualties in the uh, whole thing there, so. And it was, it was pretty. Yeah. But I have never thought much about it in the last several years. Which is fine, I just, you know, for the interview, did you ever see the movie Pro Saving Private Ryan? I never, I, I did I don't, I just made up my mind I didn't want to see it, That's I fine. didn't, yeah. Well, the only, the, really the only part of that movie that has anything to do with D-Day, I think, was the first 20 minutes where they landed on the beach yeah. and they tried to recreate what it would have been like and in the movie they had a lot of the soldiers thrown up because I guess the seas were yep but they you know I know it was a lot worse than that they had yeah. these guys thrown up overboard over the side of the ship yep. the, the veterans I've talked to said no they threw up on the guy in front of them because there's no it's place crowded to, yeah and so you know um, but anyway so I, I didn't know if you'd seen them everybody I've talked to said that was a good portrayal of course you can't visually yeah. show what really happened. And I can sense this talking to you, there was, there's probably things you've blocked out in your mind, you know, you don't need to think about anymore. Yeah. But, so I'm not trying to pry when I'm asking questions. I'm just no, that's to, okay. I, if I can remember it, why? Yeah, one of the things you asked me about the, yeah. yeah. At that time, I, I, I didn't know what boat it was. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and I, I think what I'm, you know, again, wanting to do, there's no glory in war. Yeah. But there's things, I, I hang my flag every day. And when I do that, I think about fellows like you. Because I really feel that a lot of the freedoms I enjoy today are because you guys fought that battle at D-Day. And, you know, you being at Omaha Beach, you were at the brunt of the German resistance there. So that's kind of the heart of this interview and, the, and what I'm doing this week is I'm trying to capture little pieces of history. And well, we, just, were, we were either lucky or unlucky, but we got in on most of it. Yeah. I, Say it. Go ahead. Well... How many, how many days did you go after you landed with the same clothes on? You landed with full Oh, pads. God. It's about six weeks. Mm -hmm. and, and they gave him clean socks every other day. He needed a pair, it, pair of shoes one time, and he found a boot, a boot laying there. He picked it up, and a man's foot was inside of it. Well, that was when they come, first come out with the engineer boots. They really looked classy. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want that one. Let, let's, uh, let's go back a little bit again. And I'm, trying, I'm, I'm doing this for, for a reason, but... You're getting ready to land on the beach. Now, I'm not sure of the craft you're in, but what was the order that was given? What was said, or how do you know it was time to go on to the beach? What, what happened? We never we never knew a thing until they called and told us to get up. we was getting off. They didn't tell us nothing. In fact, 11, 12 days, all we ever, all they done is most of the guys sit around and played poker and talk. They paid us off with French money when we left England. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they was playing poker. Pretty near the whole boat, most of them were. Because I know one of my close buddies in, uh, in uh, where'd Tibbetts live? Clear Lake. Clear Lake, Iowa. And he was he was ahead of me when we got was getting off of the boat. And he'd been playing poker all that time and he had a whole handful of French money and he just threw it up in the air. <laughs> He says, they ain't going to do anything good now. That's very true. So you're going in, you're getting close to shore, everybody's ready to get off the boat, right? I mean, they realize yep. that somebody's probably saying something, uh, you know, keep your head down or 
you know, the, the beach is hot. I don't know what the words are, you know, the terminology. But oh, everybody's hollering, keep your head down. Because, mm -hmm. well, you, you had to. Because you could see them tracers coming out of the side of the hill. But they killed a lot of them there on the beach because we went back after supplies for two or three weeks. We had to get our ammunition and everything from the beach there. And they they buried the guys with bulldozers. It, it was just a mess. Right on the beach? Right on the beach. Just dug a big trench and then pushed them in. And I know they we come back after the ammunition and that beach just stunk like mad. <laughs> But they did re take them up later and buried them in in there. But that's that beach was a horrible mess. But you know, I don't remember a lot of detail. I can't remember how we got them ninety millimeters up that hill. That was a terrible hill right there in front of us. I can remember putting them on a the beach, but I don't remember how we got them out of there. Because they're a huge gun. What else do you remember? Anything about that landing that day, maybe that night? I mean, were you, you said you were basically pinned down on the beach. Machine gun fire, artillery? Or, I, mean, I don't know what kind of fire it was. It was coming out of the side of the hill there. It must have been, uh, there's big guns I know, but they couldn't get them low enough to do any good. So the rest of them must have been 50 or 30 caliber or something. You know, at a, at a time like that, you know, you're so young, I guess, you know, I mean, I've been asking this question too, but were there any thoughts like wondering what am I doing here or I wish I was home or, you know, or were you thinking about God and country? I mean, it was it just really focused on your mission. You thank God a lot of times. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I think that's why they had such young guys go in. You know, an 18-year-old don't think near as much about life as a 40-year-old man does. <laughs> and so they took everybody out that was over a certain age out of our office in England before we went to France. I know we had one guy that was 42 years old and he was a, in the maintenance in the, in the motor pool and he didn't go with us. They all had to be a certain age. And I was 20, and, or 20 or 21, they called me Pop. Because I was the only one who was married in the whole, the whole outfit. See, we, we, went, to, we w went into the service in Des Moines. And we went to California for our basic training, Camp Callum, outside of San Diego. And from Camp Callum, after about eight or nine weeks, we went from there to Cape Cod. And we, we were the cadre for all the guys who were coming in from the eastern states to form our outfit. And so most of my outfit was from out east, Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, out in there. And a lot of the, we had four guys in the, were from Iowa in the cadre. But the, most of the young guys were from out east. And that's why they pick young guys, because they just don't think it's good. I mean, they don't, they'll do something where an older guy wouldn't. I suppose that was a reason for filing them out before we went in there. Yeah. So when you, did you say there was one ramp and everybody went out the ramp, or you remember? No, we crawled on the side of the boat, too. Did you but have I a can't, lot? I can't remember what kind of a boat it was. I wonder if it was an L6. Well, if you were underneath, I don't know. I haven't heard that before. This stuff for a long time or ever. I mean, um. Some things I remember because, like, uh, see, we went in June the 4th or 5th. And uh, my wife was out in the east with me, and she was pregnant when I went overseas. And my son was born in uh, July 30th, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even find out till September. So uh, we just did, we didn't get no mail, we didn't get nothing for oh it was pretty a couple of months before we got any mail. So you couldn't really ride home or anything either, right? Well, I rode every day, but it didn't get home. Yeah. 
And she was just like me. When we did get it, we'd get it in bunches, and you'd read, read one month, and then you'd read back or forward. You never got them in order. Yeah. So I remember that, too. But I know the Red Cross sent me a yellow sheet about 10 or 12, and all in the middle it said, Sun Born, that's all it said. In September, so I didn't know whether they were okay or nothing else. That'd be hard, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah. Put, put on a pretty good drunk. Colonel come around and give me the telegram, I remember that, and he handed me a bottle of something, I don't know, it was rum or whiskey or something. But I got pretty looped then. So since you were a little older maybe than some of the guys, I mean, do they look up to you? Did they come to you when it got tough? Or I mean, what, what was the feeling about that? Or we, you know, I mean, did you? My section always looked up to me. Of course, I was a section leader. So our, our job after we got in was ammunition. We had to get ammunition to the guns. That was our mission. And it kept us plenty busy. Tell me a little bit about what you mean by that. It kept you plenty busy. Well, we had to go back to the beach to get ammunition, and then we had to take it up to the guys on the guns, and kept you going back and forth. And so you took the ammunition up? Yep. Was that dangerous? Yep. Tell me about that a little bit. What were you doing? I mean, tell me. Well, we loaded the ammunition on two and a half ton trucks and then took them up and took them out to the bat each battery and the ammunition they needed. It got rough at times, but we, we never had any hand-to-hand -hand combat at all. How does it feel to be shot at? It feels very rough. I, I, don't, I don't think I ever come that, well, I come close a couple times, but uh, you know, you never thought of it that way, though. The, we had uh, we had four mounted 50 caliber machine guns, and we had a guy in the A battery that I, I knew. And I went up there, and he wanted me to relieve him while I went to the bathroom. And I, rela I relieved him for, oh, I say 15, 20 minutes. And then when he come back, he got up in a turret, and I got out. And I didn't get uh, 20 feet from the gun on me. He just got blew all the heck. A bullet must have come right between the armor and the, where the guns come out. Just hit him right in here and just really racked him. I remember the kid, and I can't remember his name now. But I knew him pretty well then. Did you try to help him? Yeah, you could do. Called, called for medics. <laughs> there wasn't nothing you could do to help him. I know that. When you see something like that, I mean, you're not really trained or prepared for that. I mean, how does a person react to that? You just, again, are you just in a certain mindset where you just... You, you must be in a certain mindset because it doesn't bother you. I mean, that much, really, at the time. It's just like people down here, they say, oh, don't mention this when you're eating and stuff. We had dead bodies all around us, all the time. We was eating and sitting right beside one, you know. There's nothing you could do about it, you had to eat. But we never thought anything of it at that time. And when we got in for it, they wouldn't let us touch any of the dead bodies, theirs, because they booby trapped a lot of them, so you left them alone. So, I don't know. Were you ever, did you ever have to shoot against the Germans, or were you just basically supporting the batteries there? Was there a time oh. where you actually had to fire at them, or I don't know what you were doing? At that the only time we got into real trouble was when, during the breakthrough. There was two or three any aircraft outfits in that line, that's where the Germans come in. And uh, there was some hand-to-hand -hand stuff. But outside of that, there wasn't much hand-to-hand -hand stuff. You just had to worry about a guy coming around the corner and shooting it with you t with a tank or something. Patton saved our rear there, I guess. We was in Spa, Belgium when that came too. He, uh, we sure was glad when we heard them tanks. I know that. <laughs>
Anything else you remember? I mean, I think we pretty much covered it, but just, uh, you know, was there a, a, was that the worst thing you probably saw? Was that friend of yours that yep. was killed like that? Oh, I've seen a lot of them killed, but yeah. I, I never even come close. Why, why, why did you make it through? The good Lord was with me, I guess. I wanted, I was, they wanted to save me for something, evidently. Did you find yourself praying for yourself or others? Yep. He prayed a lot. There's a reason for everything, I guess. I don't know what some of the reasons were at that time. It kind of confused me, but... What about the battle itself? It was definitely something we had to do, right? Yep. And we didn't get too close to a lot of it. See, we were at St. Lowe when they bombed St. Lowe on with you know anything about the territory. But they just riddled that place. There wasn't a, there wasn't a whole building in that whole place when the, the planes from England come over and bombed. It was just massacred. Because we were, we were about a half, three quarters of a mile outside of St. Lowe with the guns. And it was shaking so bad we couldn't even eat dinner. The whole ground was shaking. So you know there's, there's a lot of tons of bombs went in there. But to get real, I never got any real hand of hand fighting. Never did. I was going to ask you, any reports again? One more time, I want to ask you that. Before you landed on Omaha, did they say it's bad? It's not that bad. They give they give each one of us a letter. I got one somewhere from Eisenhower that said we were the chosen few that were chosen to do this job and we knew we could do it and blah, 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 the whole thing and then wish us luck. <laughs> and I got that letter somewhere, I don't know where it's at. Did you guys read those on ship? Mm-hmm. Did everybody think good? Did it motivate everybody or was it kind of like a joke? We knew, uh, we knew we were getting in something bad. You could just tell by the letter. <laughs> He didn't actually come out and say it was an invasion in that letter, though. So you didn't know it, quite what, what it was? We knew we were going into France somewhere. We had to know that because we were paid in French money. And that's the only reason we knew we was going into France. Of course, that's what we was there for all the time. Mm -hmm. I had somebody refer to that as invasion money. Could be. Could be. I've never heard that term before. I thought that was kind of interesting. He thought... Live every day like it's your last one. Because it's, you don't know. It's just like this war that's coming up. It's coming. But there's... Uh, they've stalled on, the, on that war, too, on Hitler. The longer they stalled, the worse it got. If they'd have waited much longer, Hitler'd had the rest of it. So I think this guy is the same way. I think he's a fruitcake. So what, what, again, what would you tell kids today? I mean, if kids are watching this, and you're a veteran of World War II, how would you tell those kids to live their lives? I mean, are there things you would advise them of as far as the, the life that they're living today? What would you tell them? Oh, I don't know. I hate to get dramatic on them. I think they should live their lives and tur turn to God more than anything else, I think, it would help. Uh, kids don't today. We got too many oh, TV and everything else shows everything else but what they should show. And it's getting worse all the time. So I tell them to live a good, clean life and be, be family oriented. Because, uh, we we'll never know what's going to happen. But at that time, we didn't think like they do today. If we, if they'd have done some of the things then that they do today, we'd have told them to heck, we'd have rebelled. That's the way the kids do today. But you, when we was in the service, when a guy gave you an order, that was that was law. You didn't say yes or no or am I going to do? You either done it or else. And you just thought that way. But these kids today, if they make them do something they don't want to do, they just, they balk. And it's a, uh, I can see why they do, 
but it's sure changing things a lot. I wish I could remember more, but I can't. No, you did good. You, you, you remembered plenty. I just want to make sure that you think you... Sorry, what did you say? How did you get on the beach again? From below or something? I don't remember. There was some of them up on the top and went down the ladders. And some of them went out front. So I don't know. And then you yourself, do you remember how you got... I went down the ladder. Down the ladder. Okay. Were they shooting at that time? Yep. Bullets hitting the ship or what? It, they was shooting... Everything at that time. In fact, there was bodies floating in the water. But I, I, I must have just blocked that out because I, I don't, I don't even think of it now. I just remember a few instances now and then, but you know, at that age, I don't think we think like we do when we're older. Nothing bothers you because we were, we were at one place one time. And we couldn't get this one. There was a machine gun firing at us. And we couldn't get at him. And this one kid says, I'll get at him. He took a, three or four hand grenades and went, went around him, threw hand grenades in the holes. And he didn't think a thing of it. He just done it. Bob Knudsen, 18 years old, from Maine. That's, so young kids is a lot... You think a lot different than you do when you get older. Here's your newspaper. I'm coming out of this. Uh, uh, document that that's, that's your wife there. Yeah. How many years again, Tally? Uh, in, March, in March now, it will be 61 years. Did you have a big to do at the 60th? Or did mm -hmm. you guys, yeah. What'd you do? The kids all come down. We had a big party at the. We had a dinner the night before, and then we had a big party over at one of the clubhouses here. And, Chandler? Mm -hmm. All right. and so I have a niece living here and she has two daughters uh -huh. and they're married and, and each have a child and then my sister lives here she's a flight attendant for American Airlines she uh, she's your sister. 19, your sister? 19 years younger than me Why? she went as, as 50 50 years old as a flight attendant and she's received so many awards she had real good schooling real good education and seems to know how to handle people, where these young ones, flight attendants, you know how snotty they can get. How old is she now? She's 61. Whoa, she, and she's she was, still doing it. Yeah, she was 61 That's in great. February. <coughs> she doesn't really look that old, does she? No, she don't really. That's the one that has the son that's the captain in the Marine Corps, major in the Marine Corps. Good. Oh, my goodness. That. Sergeant. Yep. Yeah, go ahead and put your oxygen on if you want. Then I want you to show me that stuff like you were just showing me. Okay. Huh. Tell me what you remember about that. Where'd you get these? Uh, now tell me what this is again. This is off a of field German field marshal. Did you take it off of him or did yep. you just... Holy he smart. didn't need it anymore. <laughs> okay. And these I got off the German rivals. Those are bayonets? Bayonets. Okay. Great. Okay. Just show me the uniform again. Just pick that up and show it to me. He's even got his overcoat in there. His winter overcoat. Is that right? In the Army. Wow. There we go. There we go. And I can see it. a good shot of that. That's the original jacket, huh? That's it. That's it, man. Great. See her, uh, our, what, second nephew or whatever it is, he's, he's getting my medals for me, he says. Oh, is that right? I give him my serial number and my copy of my discharge. And he says you should have the medals. What else do you got in there? What, yeah. Can you what, can you put that hat on? Will that fit you? I think his head changed. Is that your army cap or VFW cap? Well, it's an army one here. It's falling apart. Is, it, is that an old army hat there? Yeah. Mm, that don't even fit anymore. That looks fine. <laughs> now this is going to sound silly, but can you do a salute for me? 
There you go. Great. Woo! It's been a while since you've done that, I bet, huh? Yeah, it is. What else was in there, did you say? Anything else, or is that it? That's all the army stuff, I think. Okay. Wait, pair of pants and... Yeah. You got my tie in there. Wow. And that's even his tie. Shirt. shirt. And uh, okay. underwear. Okay. The rest of us Bobby's baby shoes. That's okay. Great. That was and good. Then, and then your army coat. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm glad you showed me that. I'm glad you remember to show me that.